Welcome to all of you on a hopefully bright summer day. I'll just start by giving a brief summary of the last month for our society. First of all, and I'm very happy about this, registrations are open for Seville and we already have our first registrations. We are reshaping the scientific program right now and thank for, uh, thanks to all our presenters who agreed to, to come to Seville. And I would just like to remind you, we'll have a special COVID-19 and also a Spanish track. Uh, another thing is maybe you have seen the newsletter. We, we would love to show the world the width of our community. Um, so we start a call for input on your personal journey in simulation. So if you could put up um, a short video or some text, just send it to us. The details are uh, in the newsletter. Now I'm um, happy to continue with our uh, Lou Wondorf lecture series with our speaker today, who is Professor Vicky LeBlanc. Now Vicky LeBlanc is the director of the University of Ottawa Skills and Simulation Center and a chair and professor of the Department of Innovation in Medical Education, also at the University of, of Ottawa. She has many years of experience um, in research, especially on optimizing the use of simulation and the effects um, of emotions and stress on the on performance. She's an absolutely accomplished researcher with many national and international publications serving on editorial boards. And, and I think this is a very important aspect, lobbying for the advancement of simulation-based uh, education on a national and international uh, level. I will not continue rambling on about Vicky because we all want to to hear her talk. Um, I'm very glad she agreed to, to do it today. This topic is indeed even more relevant in, in the times we're, we're living right now. And before I hand over to Lou, I would like to thank you all from the whole of the executive committee for your continued support of SESAM and for all the work and effort going into this in these times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Greetings, fellow CESA members. As Mark has introduced me, I am Lou Obendorf, and we very much look forward to being together with you in Milan this week. Unfortunately, as we all understand, we are facing extraordinary times. I want to mention that you, the healthcare workers and members of CESA, have made extraordinary sacrifices, and your professionalism and your diligence and your efforts at the front line of our defense against this global pandemic has revered you to us for all of your efforts. You are our new heroes. I want to thank and congratulate the leadership of SESM, the executive committee, the science committee, and all the staff for making this important pivot using technology to keep our mission and our communication alive in SESM in absence of a physical meeting. They have been very innovative, very entrepreneurial. And as such, uh, we in the Obendorf Foundation uh, remain committed to the mission and role of CESA. This Obendorf lecture series is designed to give you and provide for you the challenges and opportunities that these interesting times present for us. The three speakers they have chosen for this Obendorf lecture series will continue to challenge you, continue to offer you new opportunities to use our experiential technology and what we have developed over the last 25 years as a community in new ways to teach, new ways to communicate and challenge and educate. The mission and goals of SESAM are alive and well. And we will stay with you and we will support you. Thank you very much. Be well. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, and uh, I was asked to speak about how we can think about emotional resilience uh, in simulation during these uncertain times. So what I wanted to do was spend a bit of time talking to you about how we as simulation educators can approach the fact that our learners are going to be having strong emotions as they come to do simulation and how we can support them thinking about it at the individual level 
uh, but also thinking about it at the level of, of how our systems can be influencing that. Um, and, and I don't think I need to convince anybody in this group um, that simulation-based learning is emotional, even in the best of times. Um, we know from our learned experiences, we know from some of the research that we've done, that our learners will actually feel a lot of emotions when they come to simulation because we're putting them in a situation where they're vulnerable and they're being challenged um, uh, in order to, to learn. We, we find a situation now with, with COVID having affected so many things in our lives, uh, shutting down clinical practices, shutting down some of our medical school, some of our training, and now, depending on the different stages, people are moving to different levels of, of reintegration and, and you know, having to think that we're going to live with this for a while. Um, and we know that when these kind of disasters happen, whether or not they're short-term disasters or they're long-term disasters, there's a lot of different phases that individuals will go through, um, either as they prepare for something that's that's happening, or uh, they're in the early stages that the um, you know the disaster technical assistance center will say you know people are going to be in a heroic honeymoon. People want to come together and be helpful, and they feel driven. Um, it gets into a time where there's going to be fatigue and, and disillusionment, and then there's learning to live with this and, and move forward with, you know, they, they say, you know, learning to live with the grief or le learning to reconstruct what we're doing because our lives have changed. And I think that the challenging thing that we're going to have as simulation um, educators is that our learners are all going to find themselves at different phases of, of this kind of work, whether it's because we're in different countries that are having different, uh, that are different stages or they might have different sort of hotspots, or the way that they're dealing with it as individuals. So the reality is, is that you add, you add the fact that simulation is already an environment that we know is going to trigger emotions um, for, for educators, for our learners. You put them in a situation that is even more challenging at a, at a global level. Um, and I think when we're approaching simulation, then we will recognize that our learners are going to present to our simulation sessions with a lot of varying emotional reactions and tolerance to emotions. Um, we have some that are going to be happy and excited that things are starting to resume and that they, they can start seeing forward progress in their training. We're going to have people that have frustration or anger because of the restrictions that are still existing. Um, and we're going to have some that are going to have anxiety because are we opening too fast? Are they going to be at risk? Um, and we're also going to have people that are going to have sadness, whether they have sadness because of personal events that have happened or, or things that are happening at a global level. So as we approach our simulations moving forward, we have to be prepared that in addition to the normal emotions that we have, our learners are going to be bringing other sort of baseline emotions with them and a different level of tolerance. So the question that that poses for us as simulation educators is how is that going to affect how they're going to learn from these, um, these simulation events that they're coming in? Do we need to pay attention to these emotions? How do we pay attention to them? How do we manage them so that we can ensure that when we're doing these activities that they're going to learn the essential things that we feel they need to learn? In addition, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the other reason that we do simulation is to prepare individuals for future events. And we know that as our learners are going to be going into a very changed clinical environment, they're going to have strong emotions there as well. Whether it's caring for patients that are potentially positive, whether it's the challenges of interacting with families that can't be present or, or patients that are, that are um, struggling through what they're dealing with individually. So how as educators can we prepare the learners to recognize these emotions and be able to manage them. And so I, I want to talk about um, these different elements through the talk. Um, and we know from a lot of the research that emotions actually have a strong relationship with cognition. Um, and the research is increasingly telling us that it's not that emotions and cognition live sort of separately in different parts of the brain or how we function. But rather, we, we have increasing research both about the way that the brain is, 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 is built, about the way that the physiology works, is that emotions, the brain is primed for processing emotional information. And that these emotions, what they do is they guide our cognitive processes in order to direct our attention, direct our memory, and direct our judgment towards addressing whatever it is that is triggering um, the, the event. And in psychology, this is happening in increasingly predictable ways um, and what we call this is called mood congruent processing, is that we selectively pay attention to and we selectively recall information that's going to be congruent with our emotions. And I really like this slide because these are two pictures of the same tree, 
Um, but it shows us that basically when we're sad and morose, the world we live in is essentially a different world for us than when we're happy and, 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 and joyful because we interpret ambiguity differently. We notice different things. We, we approach problems differently. And I just want to give you some examples of, of how that happens. Um, so one of the things that emotional events do is that they strongly shape attention. They capture our, 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 our cognitive processes. And that emotional information is going to be detected faster than neutral information, especially when we're in an emotional state. So if I'm in a situation, I'm looking at a crowd, I'm feeling anxious, there could be a sea of neutral faces, but if there's one person that is frowning or looking doubtful, that is actually going to capture my, my attention because when we're in an emotional state, everything is, all our senses are heightened in order to look for things that are either signs that everything's okay if we're happy or that are signs of threat or, or if we're in, a, in an anxious or, or fearful kind of way. In turn, what that means is that emotional events are actually gonna have a strong impact on what it is that we remember from them. Um, and we do know from a lot of research that we do have greater recall for emotionally arousing situations, particularly negative ones. We can all think the things that happened in our lives that were strongly negative emotions, that these memories have stayed with us. They feel vivid, they feel strong, and we feel like we could remember a lot of details. And there is some research to suggest that stress actually and other negative emotions actually enhance memory consolidation. And consolidation is when you have new and fragile memories that are turned into permanent memories. The trick though, is that quantity doesn't necessarily equal quality. And although we're gonna remember more information from these emotional events, that information is going to be biased and it's gonna be shaped in, in very particular ways. One way is that emotions are associated with what we call a memory narrowing effect. So when we're in an emotional situation, we're going to remember information that is central in time, in space, conceptually, to whatever it is that triggered the emotion. And that's going to come to the cost of, of information on the, on the periphery. So one example that's presented by Elizabeth Kinsinger in her, in her paper is they showed groups of individuals two pictures of the same street. And one image was a very gruesome accident that actually, a picture of a gruesome accident that triggers a strong emotional reaction. And the control group was an image of a taxi that was riding down the same street. And they controlled for everything like salience and, and, and vividness. What they found is that the accident group had excellent memory for the car accident. They could know all of the details of, of that better than the people could describe the taxi but it came at the cost of poorer memory for, for the surrounding uh, street. Um, we see that a lot also in eyewitness testimony, a phenomenon called weapons focusing, that if people are victims of a crime where there is a weapon, let's say a gun or, or a knife, um, and they have to testify and, and describe who the perpetrator is, um, what we find is that they'll be very able to describe minute details about that weapon but it comes at the cost of being able to not be able to describe the perpetrator as well, because that emotion causing thing, that weapon captured attention and that's what the, the cognitive resources were at. If we think about that in a simulation environment, if I am a learner and I'm nervous about doing simulation um, and I have an emotional reaction that's caused by the fact that I'm being observed by uh, my fellow classmates or I'm being, I'm being sort of, put on the spot by a faculty member that is that is challenging and that's causing my emotion my tension is going to be about what these people think about what I do and they're going to remember that at the cost of what's happening in the scenario as opposed to if it's the scenario itself the characteristics of that simulated patient that is causing the emotions then my resources are going to be triggered um, to that and I'm going to remember that information um, so it's very important that we have to recognize that our attention and memory is going to be linked to whatever caused that emotion. And if that emotion is separate from what we want them to learn, it's gonna come, come at a cost. The other thing that we know in terms of biases for memory is that emotions can be associated with incorrect reconstructions of previous events based on our expectations. So I'll give you the example of September 11th, 2001. Uh, for those of us who live in North America, it's, it's, it's an event that we'll all remember when the planes flew into the Twin Towers in New York City. And even now, um, almost 19 years later, if you ask individuals where they were, what did they witness, how strong are the memories, people will report that they remember exactly where they were at the moment and, and how well they knew this. 
um, and these feel quite vivid. And, and there was research around that and it showed that, you know, nearly 100% of respondents, this was two years after or six years after, remember exactly where they were, what they were doing the moment they heard about the September 11th attacks. But where it gets interesting is that they find places of false memories of 73% of people reported incorrectly that they saw on television the first plane striking the tower. There was no video of the first plane striking the tower. Um, I was actually living in New York City that day um, and we thought it was a small commuter plane that had gone in. It's only when the second plane hit and we started hearing different reports that it realized that it was a massive terrorist attack. Um, and so what these examples tell us is that emotional events are going to be vivid, but they're not always accurate. And you actually don't need large dramatic events to, to see those effects. This is a study that we did um, that was putting paramedics through a scenario and we put them through a, a low stress scenario, which is the blue bars. And we put them through um, a high stress scenario. That's something that would be realistic that they could encounter. And then after that, we asked them to fill out an, an accident, uh, an ambulance call report. And we looked to see how many errors of omission they did. So that's if they, if they failed to remember information, they failed to put it something that had happened. We also looked at commission errors, which was reporting information that was not made known to them or something that didn't happen. And what we saw is that for the omission errors, so the two that are on the, the left, there was no difference in terms of, of errors between the low stress and high stress. So regardless of whether stressed or not, you're not more likely to forget things. What we found is similar to the September 11th example is they were more likely to make commission errors. They were more likely to report information that hadn't been made known to them. They were more likely to report procedures that hadn't happened. Um, and so this is actually a pretty consistent thing that, that we see um, in, in looking at memory. And it's not only negative emotions that can deal with that, positive emotions can also show some of those effects. The third example that I want to that I want to share is that emotional events are also going to influence how we see and how we act on our world. So if I give you this example of the this image on the left, um, and I ask you to compare it to these two images on on the right, and I would ask individuals, do you? And I'm going to ask you to think about that image on the left. Do you think it resembles more the image on the top right? or do you think it resembled more the image on the bottom right? If you think that it looks more like the image on the top right, what you're engaging with is global processing. You're looking at the whole of the structure and making decisions based on that. And research shows that people who are in a happy state tend to engage more in global processing. If you looked, if you thought it looked more like the image on the bottom, you're not process, you're not, you're doing more local processing. So you're looking more at the individual details and how much do they look alike. Um, and this is the point where everybody is always waiting to see what emotional state is, is linked with this. Um, research shows that people who are in a sad state are more likely to engage in, in local processing. Um, now, the important thing to point out here is that this is not a test of your emotional um, of state, is that people tend to be on a spectrum of being more global or more local processing. And, but depending on the mood that they're in, they're going to shift a little bit more towards local processing when they're sad, and they're going to shift a little bit more towards global processing when, when they're happy. So why do we care about these kinds of examples? Why does this matter? Well, it's because we know that global processing is linked with a greater ability to make associations between relevant learning events. This is what learning is, that ability to be in a situation um, and to know that despite the surface details being different, the nature of the problem is the same as a previous solution that we had, right? That ability to make links between different things is, is in addition to remembering things, that's a core to learning. And so we know that global processing is important for, um, uh, for, for learning. And so when we start putting these, uh, these different informations together, we know that when our learners are coming in and they have negative emotions and particularly stress and anxiety are two of the ones that we've really looked at, we, they will have increased memory consolidation of information um, that is going to be linked with the cause of the emotion, right? So that has to have that strong link but it can be prone to biases 
Um, and we also know that they're gonna have a little bit more sort of fixation or less cognitive flexibility. When our learners are coming in with positive emotions, we know that there's an increased problem solving ability and increased ability to transfer to new situations, but it has its downside as well, is that when people have positive emotions, they're more likely to have increased distractibility. Positive emotions tell us everything's okay, we can let our guard down. So this is actually when we're more likely to be distracted and potentially make small errors that could lead to, to some larger consequences. Um, so the emotions that our learners are gonna come in are going to have an impact in terms of what they pay attention to during a simulation session, what, um, how it is that they approach problems, how they try to solve it. And it's also gonna have important effects on what they're gonna take away from it and, and what they're gonna learn from it. So as simulation educators, how do we navigate this during simulations, right? We don't know what emotional state our learners are. Um, we're, the research on how emotions shape our thinking and our cognition is still developing. So how do we approach this? Well, I think one of the things that we need to do is we have to be very wary of explicitly manipulating the emotions of our learners. Um, because one of the things that we do know from the literature is that individuals are not always gonna experience the target emotion. We can try to make people happy by asking them to remember something <clears throat> or trigger something, but we're triggering a memory that makes them nostalgic and they're going to be sad. Or we could be doing something that we try to challenge them, but they might someone might feel tricked and they're gonna have a reaction of anger. Um, so we have to be very careful, especially when they're already gonna be coming in with maybe a heightened emotional states, maybe less tolerance given the global events that are happening. So we have to be careful as educators in terms of how much of the emotions we're actually looking to manipulate here because the, the baseline level is gonna be highly variable in different levels of tolerance. But that said, we do know that emotions are likely going to occur in, in simulations. So when we do that, it's gonna be important to link those emotions in time, in space or concept with the to be learned information. So anything that you're creating in your simulation activities, if it's gonna cause an emotion, make it come from your simulated mannequin, make it come from the team that you're engaging, that they're engaging with so that their cognitive resources are all oriented towards that and be careful about anything on the periphery, either being observed or those aspects of it that could pull their cognitive resources away. The other thing that you want to do, because we know that positive emotions are better linked with problem solving and, and, and cognitive flexibility, after you do the simulation, before you go into sort of the analysis stage of your simulation, where you're trying to close those performance gaps, it's gonna be very important to identify and be able to diffuse strong emotions before you go that. One framework that we use quite a bit um, in Canada and in North America is, is the PEARLS framework um, that Adam Chang and, and Walter Epic developed, which has that reaction space. And it's not meant to go into a lot of time, but it's meant to say, what emotions do people have? How do we name them? How do we recognize them? How do we normalize them? And if they're really strong, how do we diffuse them so that you don't have all of this taking over their cognitive resources before you go into the, the analysis stage? The other thing that you're, it's gonna be really key to do is, is to reinforce the key learning information and be wary of any ambiguity. And I know that a lot of time when we do simulations, we have a lot of discussions and talk, um, but it, you know, it's one thing, that's one of the reasons we can reinforce at the end, uh, what are the key uh, learning points that there are. If you have specific learning objectives that you have for that simulation session, maybe having handouts that can have the key learning points that they can take away that they can reinforce. The other thing that people can do is if they're more experienced simulation educators and they're comfortable writing on a whiteboard or a chalkboard while they're doing the debriefing is to maybe more explicitly write out the key points that are happening and to encourage the learners to take pictures or to take that information. So what you want to do is if there's going to be some biases in their memory, have that written information, that key information that can then be able to reinforce that and correct any kind of ambiguity that you're going to have so that they can have some, some learning. <clears throat> now, these are all tactics that we can do at the level of the individual. And what we need to think about, and I, as, particularly in North America, recent events that have been happening um, around the Black Lives Matter movement and, and a lot of these discussions that were happening is, as simulation educators, we also have to be careful that as we try to support our, our learners, um, 
we're not sort of creating canaries that are then going into a toxic environment. We have to think about the broader culture around that. We can't isolate them um, as, as is in this picture with, with the canary. And we have to recognize that the culture and the environment in which we all exist um, is going to have an impact on the simulation activities and on their emotional reaction when they're coming in. Because when we think about simulation, whether we participate or even we're doing this as, as instructors, because we always learn as well, part of that is yes, is to learn knowledge, we learn behaviors, we learn skills, we learn team building characteristics, resource allocation. But simulation is also a very powerful tool where we learn how to do social networking. We, a lot of simulations we do in groups. We talk about how you negotiate, how you communicate. Um, we build these links with individuals that are gonna be the ones that we're practicing with, right? So there's some role modeling that can happen around social networking, but there's also a mechanism around which we create norms around identity, values, um, the emotional experience and, and the manifestations. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, what happens at SIM stays at SIM. Simulation is a privileged environment for this to happen. Um, but we also have to recognize that they are coming to us from whatever culture or environment that they have. And that the way that we approach things like emotional experiences or managing them is where they start creating a lot of these norms around that. And these emotions are going to be experienced in light of culture, both the macro culture that we have in a country that we have in a region, and also the micro culture that we might have in our group, but also about the, the cultural structures that we have. And just some examples of, of how this can happen is that um, this is where they learn what are the norms that describe what should be felt or expressed by learners or educators. So if as an educator, as a group, we say, well, there's no room for emotions in this then the norms we're telling people is you don't feel emotions, you need to suppress them. And we know that there's some risk with suppressing emotions. Um, this is where we can have these conversations about what emotional experiences are encouraged or what is actually going to be discouraged. Is anger okay? Is happiness okay? But fear is not okay. Um, what are these messages that we're giving uh, within this culture? Structurally, there's also issues as well that we need to think about those that are gonna be in our disadvantaged positions are gonna be more likely to experience negative emotions than those in privileged roles, right? So people from, if we have a hierarchy, um, you know, for, for, for better or worse, we know that there are sometimes hierarchies within the team. Those that are lower in the hierarchy are more likely to express negative emotions. Uh, we know that race can have an effect. We know gender, socioeconomic status, our learners, more junior learners. There's increasing research that shows that those that are sort of at a more disadvantage or lower in the hierarchy, are more likely to experience negative emotions. So as SIM educators, we need to be attentive to that. Um, and not only do they have less, uh, they have more negative emotions, we also know that people who are on the lower end of a, of a hierarchy have less emotional leeway. Somebody who is at the top, who's the CEO of a company, who's in charge of a hospital, has more leeway with showing different emotions and, and getting away with it. Whereas the less power we have, um, the more we have to kind of have more of a stoicism or, or align with the emotions that there are. And the third thing that we know is that negative emotions are more likely to flow down a hierarchy. If I'm a boss and I can freely express my, nego my, my negative emotions, it's going to go to whoever's below me and then it's going to go um, below that. And that not only is this flowing downwards, but those at the bottom are going to be the recipients of that, but then they are the ones that are expected to take this and to turn it into more positivity. Um, and so we have to think about, are there some groups in addition to the overarching stronger emotional world that we live in, are there some that are experiencing this differently because of our cultural norms or because of our structures that we have in our societies? Um, and these are ideas that I think we need to start thinking about in, in simulation and, and, and how do we address that from a perspective of, of, of equity of our learners. The other reason we want to think about that is we know from a exchange theory that individuals who think that there is equity in social arrangements, who see these arrangements as being inherently just and who believe that their contributions are going to be successful, are going to have more group cohesion, they're going to be happier with the outcomes, and they're going to be more effectively committed to participating in these ongoing exchanges. So this starts to speak to, to motivation, that if they have more positive emotions, uh, we know that they're gonna have a greater interest and greater intrinsic motivation to participate. So engaging in the task for its own sake, for the sake of learning. 
if we have, whether it's the structural things or different elements that are happening and somebody has negative emotions, that can actually decrease our interest and our intrinsic motivation in a task. Um, and it's more likely to increase extrinsic emotions. So that motivation to engage in a task as a means to an end. I do simulation because I have to do simulation because if I get it checked off and I can do this, then I can go work in the clinic as opposed to I'm engaging in simulation because the value of practicing how to do suturing or the value of learning to do clinical decision-making is a value of something that I want to learn. And that motivation can actually affect what is going to be the learning. And we're still doing the research to try to understand that. But for example, we know that if people are experiencing fear, we might not see an impact on the actual motivation to learn, but there's gonna be a direct negative impact on learning. So they still engage and want to learn, but they don't retain that information. Um, guilt and sadness can lead us to have more motivation to learn, but it's not going to have an impact on learning from errors, which is what simulation is about. It's about putting forward, uh, identifying performance gaps and, and learning them. Um, shame, uh, which is a powerful one, can lead us to have greater attention to feedback, but we, we don't yet know how that affects learning. Uh, relief, interestingly, is a paradoxical, is a little bit paradoxical because the more relief we have and we're done our simulation, we're going to pay less attention to feedback and it can then actually subsequently uh, decrease our learning motivation, our behavior. So if, if I did a simulation and I'm too relieved and I'm too happy about it, I think, okay, I don't have anything to learn from that. I don't then need to change my, my activities. So then when we come into our, our simulation sessions, um, we need to think about not just at the level of the individual who is doing the intrapersonal attempt to manage their emotions, this is going to be affected by a lot of other things. And so we have to think a more system level approach to this and think about what are the system and cultural norms, either the broad level or even the local ones that are saying what emotions are, are allowed, what emotions are, are, are disallowed that's going to influence how they try to shape it. But even us as individuals at the interpersonal level, we can influence um, each other in terms of how we're experiencing, um, how we're experiencing these emotions. So as simulation educators, we need to think about this broader system level uh, to get us thinking about what emotions, you know, are emotions allowed? What emotions are allowed? What kind of emotional regulation management do we do? And our role that we have in, in shaping that with individuals. So I think now more than ever, and I think as simulation education um, educators, we've always thought about this. We know that safe learning environment is more important than ever. We've, we've always pushed this as in simulation, but I think we need to remind ourselves and be more thoughtful about it. And we also have to think that that culture and that environment is going to be more important than whatever formal approach or words that I use. That I can, I can use a, a very good uh, Pearl's framework, I can use a very good um, advocacy inquiry question, but if my culture and my environment is not one that allows people to be vulnerable emotionally, those words are not going to be, are, are, are really not going to be helpful. So we have to think about that um, as, as we're doing it. And I think strategies we need to do in addition to the, the initial strategy I said in terms of how we link information with emotions is as educators, we need to think about how we can increase empowerment and sense of control, particularly in the ones that may be lower in the hierarchy or have lower sort of social, um, social power. And some of the ways that we know we can do this is as educators, if we explain what the processes are and the reasons why things are being done the, the way that they are. Um, that can be helpful because then people understand, have a better sense of that. We need to think about involving learners early in our negotiations and start having those conversations about how a session will play out, right? We don't need to do surprises. We say, look, this is how we're going to do this. So when we do our learner contract, our fiction contract, we can have those conversations with those learners and say, well, this is how we're thinking about having it play out. Um, and I think as, as sim educators, which we are, a lot of us, I think, tend to be, um, is to be open and responsive to feedback and maybe start thinking about how do we do things differently as we're going into the slightly more labile um, world that we're living in. Now, that's how we can approach the emotions that might come up while we're doing our simulation um, experiences. But the other thing that we can think about simulation is to prepare simulation for the emotional impact of clinical practice. Um, clinical practice has drastically changed. Um, I know that in, in North America, in terms of who's allowed to enter the hospital, in terms of what care wasn't giving for a long time, and now as we start to resume, 
Um, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of fear. There's going to be, uh, I think situations are going to be a little bit more challenging as we talk about it. So, you know, this picture of, you know, everybody's in the same storm, but not everybody is in the same boat. Um, what we can do as simulation educators is we can also use these sessions, not only to teach them the skills and the knowledge and the, the team um, skills that they're going to need, but also how they can recognize and manage their emotions when they're going to be in these challenging situations. Um, and so, so that when they can perform during these, these emotional events. And we know there's a lot of research that has looked at stress and anxiety, and we know that stress and anxiety can disrupt person, uh, performance in a lot of ways. Um, we see performance is going to be disrupted. I've shown you the example about the commissioners. Our working memory, that ability to hold information and manipulate it in our brain is going to be affected. And we also see some changes in, in reasoning. Um, and so what we need to think about is when people are left to their own devices to try to manage these, there's different ways that they can do that can either be adaptive or maladaptive. And an adaptive way is to reframe the meaning of a situation, to re-envision a problem and to try to change what the expectations are on them. And that's considered a very adaptive way. There are some that can be more maladaptive as they can change or suppress that emotional experience. So I'm not supposed to feel this, I'm gonna suppress, I'm gonna push down my anxiety. Or what they're gonna do is they're gonna change the labels to describe their feelings or their physiological state, right? Which is, this is more about maintaining sort of their appearance to others. And we know that the bottom two are actually considered maladaptive because they're not as good at, man at managing emotions and they actually lead to more negative long-term sequela. Uh, we know that avoidant coping is more likely linked with post-traumatic stress disorder. We know that it can be more likely linked with, with physical um, health issues such as, as cardiovascular incidents. So we can also think about using simulation to help our learners think about taking adaptive re um, reframing. And particularly ones that we wanna do is we can prepare them for these stressful situations by targeting emotional regulation, which is the reappraisal, is rethinking what are the demands that are being placed on me and what are the resources that I have to bring to bear and how do I reshape this as opposed to I'm not supposed to be feeling this and I need to suppress it. That suppression is something that, that is actually in the long term very problematic. And there's approaches like stress inoculation approaches where what you do is you teach individuals what their individual stress response is. Surprisingly, a lot of people aren't, don't actually know how to recognize their stress response until it reaches high levels. So how do you recognize your stress response? Teach them skills um, that can manage the physiology and, and the cognitive aspect of it. So it can be breathing tactics, it can be self-taught, it can be reframing situation. And then you place them in increasingly stressful simulated scenarios where the primary focus is on recognizing and managing their emotion as they're dealing with the scenarios. Um, and these are approaches that have been very promising in, in other fields that we can start thinking about how do we use simulation that way. So in the interest of time and to make sure we have questions, I just wanna leave you with, with some take home messages to consider um, that both when your learners are gonna be coming to the simulation, um, they're gonna be in various emotional states, they're gonna have various levels of tolerance for emotions. Um, and you also have an opportunity to use these simulation sessions, not just for learning the skills there, but for helping them prepare how they're gonna deal with the emotions in a clinical setting in a vastly changed world um, than it was even, even five, um, five months ago. So when they are in as I said, make sure you link the emotions with the information that has to be learned. Um, you want to diffuse those strong emotions before engaging in the analysis stage. Um, and so I would expect that if you do do the reactions phase about the pearls, it's not just about identifying emotions and then moving on. I think it's going to be more and more important to leave space for those meaningful and respectful conversations around the emotions that we're all feeling in this as we try to navigate our way through, through things that are changing and uncertain. Um, make sure to reinforce the key learning information, be wary of ambiguity. So any written information, again, is whether it's that page or it's a whiteboard that you can get people to record, have that written reinforcement of the key points because we know memory is gonna be influenced. But then also think about how you can use simulation to train in adaptive emotional regulation strategies. Reappraisal, mindfulness can be part of those. Um, teach them the things that are actually going to be helpful to them rather than the things that are long-term psychologically, physiologically are going to be harmful. 
And I think the last bit that we need to think about that the events of the world have shown us is we have to think about what is our local and broader culture and environmental impact happening on the emotional experience and the interpretation of our of our learners and, and how do we need to attend to that? And are there people that are particularly vulnerable that, that we need to pay attention to? Um, so these would be the, the take home messages that I would leave and, and I'd be happy to engage in, in more discussion. Um, and I've listed some articles here if people are interested in learning more from the, the cognitive perspective of, it, perspective of it. And this is my email if anybody has some uh, follow up for some questions. So thank you very much for your, for your time. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Vicky LeBlanc for that fantastic uh, talk, really helpful uh, and really stimulating in terms of uh, all of our thinking, I think about simulation and the role emotion plays, so thank you. Thank you. Um, we've, we've got a few questions coming in actually from the, um, from the live stream that I, I uh, am looking forward to getting to. And as people are getting their thoughts together, I guess I'm curious a little bit more about um, some of the cultural issues that you mentioned. Um, I think about how frequently I, uh, I'm the one at the bottom of the chain having to support, having to sort of present that positive uh, kind of response as other people are sort of raining down negative emotions on me. Um, and, and it also made me think about how frequently um, various colleagues, especially in interprofessional simulation, have that experience as well. So they're, uh, they may be getting anger from different sides and feel like they're not able to um, work with it in a meaningful way. And I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what are some of the roles that we can do as simulation educators to start to shift some of those cultural aspects? Because I think, I always think of our role as educators as being change agents as well as, as sort of uh, um, the other things that we do. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, there's, there's, th thank you, Gabe. There's, there's a lot of thoughts around that. It's, um, you know, I, I think we have to acknowledge that we have a role that even if we feel like we're not high on the totem pole as, as simulation educators there, we do have a bit of a hierarchy with our learners. Um, and so we have to create an environment where it's okay for them to say that it's not that the world, that things are not okay for them. It's, it's up to us to create an environment where it's safe environment for them to be able to share those emotions. Um, and you know, there's, there's so many directions we can go this like I know that one of the things that we've seen a lot with this pandemic um, is we can't go so far to try to create a positive tone that it's not respecting what's happening, right? You don't wanna have a hospital leadership that's saying everything's great, rah, 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 when you have frontline people that are struggling. That's not the right tone you wanna have as a simulation educator to say, hey, isn't it great? We're all here together, we're gonna to learn and, and we're gonna change the world. I think you, we have to acknowledge that things can be difficult. We have to acknowledge that it can be challenging, but we, we lead our debriefing around the idea of saying, well, what can we do when we have these emotions, right? The same way that we would do it for a clinical reasoning perspective or for a communication challenge or a resource allocation, we can have conversations around that and say, you know, has anybody else ever had these feelings where you have this happening? What are strategies that we can do, right? So those skills that we have from debriefing, we can apply it to, to that perspective um, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's a fantastic sort of perspective. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of aware of is how within the con within debriefing and within that context, we can also encourage people to use the uh, you you know use their agency really um, and uh, and to remind colleagues like I you know I'm speaking up because that's not the kind of culture I want to be a part of and I and I'm speak you know I'm speaking up professionally and appropriately, but I do want to speak up about this. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the concept of, of being allies, the concept of, of using our, our positions of power, our positions um, mm -hmm. from that perspective to advocate for our learners and to just keep our eye open to are there some that are uh, in a less favored or less powerful situation that we can support. Um, Another thing that can be interesting is these are my colleagues in Toulouse that are doing this. Um, they've been playing around with the idea of, you know, we always think about doing this collective debriefing where, you know, we do an interprofessional simulation, everybody comes together and they debrief. 
And they started having concerns around it, that there might be some power issues that people who are lower in the power spectrum might not feel comfortable doing it. So they've, they've just finished a study where they're doing, they start with an individual debriefing. Uh, with just one instructor, one person, and then they, they do the debriefing and the person, they found that the people can be a lot more open about what it is that they're sharing. And then when the group comes together, those instructors that did the one-to-one -one debriefing can then translate and sort of diffuse, bring those ideas forward, but in a more safe kind of environment. And what they've been finding is that that's actually ha seems to have an impact on the emotional reaction and the performance. Um, I don't want to say too much because they're just in the process of writing it up, but those kinds of ideas are things that we can think creatively about trying to get to those emotions and managing sort of the power differential and that cultural and the environment. I love that. I think that's really great. And uh, as a as a journal editor, I'd love to see that manuscript come through. I think that's a uh, that's uh, some fantastic work. Um, I, I want to get to some of the questions that are coming through on the live stream, Vicky, because there's some great ones coming in. Um, so how do we in this kind of current context, we're thinking about doing a lot of our work remotely uh, and simulation is being moved online and some of our debriefing is being moved online as well. And it makes us think about these questions, like how do we deal with, with emotions um, productively, supportively, appropriately in the context of an online uh, debriefing? Um, yeah. how, does that, how does that work? How do we do that? It's, you know, it's challenging because we don't know. We've, we haven't done debriefing in groups. Um, but, you know, here's what I'm going to think is, you know, these sensitive conversations are always very difficult when you're going to have, um, when you're doing it online, because you don't have that, that, that human connection in place. Um, some of the things that, that I would do as somebody who knows the re who, who knows the research, who knows the theory, although I haven't, um, done it from another perspective, um, is, um, I have everybody have their cameras on, maybe pan back enough that you can see the body language. The other thing that virtual is going to allow us to do is, especially if you're doing it through Zoom, is that you can have those private conversations, mm -hmm. um, right? And that's one of the things that I've seen has actually been a really rich way of being able to, to work with simulation or even just being able to have meetings, right? Something happens, you can do a private and be like, oh, that you seem to not like that reaction. Um, I mean, you have to, you have to have an, ex you have to be an experienced debriefer to be able to maintain that group conversation, but you could be able to use that and say, so, you know, suddenly, you know, I see that Mark is kind of not looking okay. I may be like, Mark, are you okay? Like you're, you're not, I'm not seeing you participating or I'm seeing you've been frowning a lot and you can almost have that parallel discussion, but you just, you're going to have to have that cognitive nimbleness and have a certain amount of um, comfort, but maybe, you know, co-debriefing might be a situation that allow us to help with that. And again, these are just ideas that we can explore and we can take a look at and potentially some good questions for research. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I, I'm, I'm minded, you know, just as I've been teaching uh, using synchronous online tools as well, how, how, what a high cognitive load is attached to doing that, right? Having the conversation at the same time as you're monitoring chat streams and potentially, um, you know, supporting one conversation while you're having a conversation privately with, a, you know, with another. Um, so it is quite, uh, it's, I think it's quite a, a, a big challenge and it's, and it's difficult to do. So, uh, so I think in that, in that context, I think we have to um, uh, give ourselves all a bit of a break as we get into that yeah. mode. Um, and, and but, try yeah. but I think a lot of us have had experience with co-debriefing and if we can, Absolutely. you know, whereas previously it's hard to get people all at the same place or all at the simulation center. We've been finding that with this virtual world, people are more likely to be able to come to things. So maybe we can take advantage of our ability to co-debrief to allow us to do that. And, and somebody can be attentive to the tone yeah. and the language while the other one is actively doing the, the closing the performance gaps. And you can kind of do it from that perspective. Yeah, I think that works really well. That's really nice. Um, so another question, uh, which I think uh, those of us who do simulation debriefing will have experienced before. Um, what happens when you have a participant who clearly is having an emotional reaction and is doing perhaps some of those maladaptive emotional management techniques you mentioned, right? So they're not, they're sort of suppressing those emotions. They're not allowing them kind of out in the room and, and it becomes that kind of elephant in the room. Um, and it has potentially a negative Im emotional impact on, on the rest of the group. Um, so if a participant won't open up about their own emotions, how can you then go about sort of diffusing the situation? 
Yeah. And, and you have, you know, that's a really good question because you have to go it gingerly um, because there's a couple of things you have to think about, right? You, you don't want anybody in this group to lose space and for this to become an unsafe environment. Um, you also, you know, attending to emotions is not about going into therapy uh, with, right. with the individuals. Um, so you, you go at it gingerly. If it's a group of learners that you know really well, and this is a group of learners that you know they feel a safe environment and they feel they have that trust, sometimes mm. you can just name it and be, you know, hey, Mark, I, I noticed that that um, you, you seem to be frowning or I noticed that you're not really participating. Um, are, are you, do you, you know, it seems like maybe you're frustrated. You can name the emotions. Be careful, you might get the wrong one. Um, and if they don't want to come back, don't push it, right? Where you don't belabor the issue, but in your mind, you might know, okay, there's something going on there. Maybe mm. follow up with the learner after and say, Hey, was, was something going on there? I was, I was a bit concerned. Um, or I think there was something going on that maybe you didn't feel comfortable, right? So it doesn't have to be in that moment because we've all been a culture differently to deal and manifest and share our emotions. And that's going to come out and you're not going to be able to fix that in one debriefing session. Yeah, absolutely right. I, I love that approach too of of keeping the um, keeping the focus on what you observe rather than necessarily um, accusing people of their emotions as well. So um, you know, uh, like I, the look on your face makes me think that you're frustrated, and I want to check in with you about that. You know, is different to I see you're frustrated um, because of course that places back on the learner the. The, the responsibility of, of potentially correcting me as the facilitator. Yeah, then, um, no, I'm not frustrated. I'm, I'm not frustrated. I'm just, I'm just thinking. I'm just, I'm just yeah. concentrating. And then you're like, okay, well, you got to let that one go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, some colleagues have uh, written in to say they're doing a project on auto simulation. So where learners are doing simulation tasks on their own, and then the debriefing is done later. Um, and the question is around how do you potentially deal with emotions um, or capture emotions in that kind of situation that you can come back to uh, later in a, in a moment of debriefing later? Yeah, um, you, it's a bit of a tough one, right? Because whenever you're asking people to retroactively think about their emotions, that's going to be flavored by the how they're feeling. So you can try to sort of say, okay, when you finish that simulation um, and you did that, how did you feel at that moment when you walked out? How did you feel? Or, um, you know, if, if let's say it was, it was a sim, it was an airway management and, and they had to try with the, with the laryngoscope a few times and you say, okay, so, you know, how did you feel when you had to do a second attempt? And you can try to kind of trigger them for that. If you think that the emotion they felt at that moment is an important one for learning, or it's an important one for, for influencing what it is that they did. I wouldn't say go to get the emotions for the sake of emotions, right? A lot of the time when we do do the reactions phase, um, if you take a Pearl's framework, it's because you don't want strong emotions that could then influence how their cognitive processes are going there. You want, you want to diffuse them. So you don't always have to go to the emotions. Only go to the emotions if you think that they're having an impact on either what they did in the scenario, or you think they're going to impact that reflection and that learning perspective, right? So when we say be attuned to emotions, you don't always have to have those conversations. If you have a group that did something, they come out, they're in a good mood, they're talking, they're feeling great. If you do the reactions phase, it's going to be a really quick one. How was that? That was great. That was great. Yeah, simulation can be a lot of fun sometimes, right? So let's have that discussion. You don't need to belabor the point. Yeah, and simulation can be really good at helping us reinforce good practice, um, yeah. which is often what happens when they're when they come out and they are expressing those emotions. Yeah, um, and you know, I, I think Peter Peter Diekman is is on this, right? He he yeah. gave a great talk uh, last year at the Canadian Simulation Summit about. You know, for a lot of time, we talk about debriefing being about the performance gaps, and we tend to think about it from a negative perspective. And he he's challenging us to think, well, let's also think about the positive deviance positive. And, and going from that perspective. And there can be really rich debriefing that can happen of saying, like, that was spectacular. What yeah. happened there that you could then bring to, to later points as well? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I sometimes wonder, just going back to one of the things you mentioned earlier, if the one of the reasons we tend to avoid emotion is because of this notion of, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a qualified clinical psychologist, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a therapist, and so 
I, this is all too much for me to deal with. Um, yeah. And I, I particularly liked your, um, uh, the way you articulated it just then, sort of tying into this idea of, um, you know, actually we engage with emotion in order to access our behavior and our cognition. Um, and that's, I, for me, that's really helpful. Like in what ways do emotions help us get a, a better handle on our thinking and on our behavior. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're not always going to be comfortable and there's going to be a situation where learners are having a very difficult emotional situation. Um, and either it's, it's blocking it or we're a little bit worried about their, their mental health, right? This has kind of triggered something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I view this as a lot of different cases where we can have difficult debriefings. Um, so we use the same skills that we do for that. You, you can name it. Um, you can normalize it. Um, you don't want to make the person lose face, but this is where you can kind of go to the group and say, has anybody else ever felt this? And how would, how have you dealt with this? Or how would you be able to do this? Right. So you can bring it out, but don't keep the lens on this person. Who's going to be even more vulnerable. Do use that group tactic the same way you would do with somebody says, well, I always freeze. And you might go to the rescue. Well, has it ever happened to you that you freeze in clinical mm -hmm. settings? And let's think strategically how we would be able to address that. We can do that with emotions as well, right? We are not therapists. We, um, if we try to do this in that environment, we run the risk of doing more damage if we try to do therapy. It's more of identifying it, naming it, normalizing it, and then, then moving it to closing that performance gap um, is and trying to identify the frame of how would you be able to address this when you find yourself in the next situation and bring the group in to help develop those strategies. Yeah, really nice. Um, a question coming in from uh, colleagues in London at the Sim Center that I work at. Um, so we use the diamond model of debriefing, which you may be familiar with. And um, and we ask people about their feelings very explicitly. It's a part of the analysis phase, so a three-phase debrief, but, but actually where we, uh, we sort of bring it back into the analysis phase um, okay. slightly later in the debrief. And the question is, um, what do you think about that? Um, so rather than a reactions phase, um, asking people about their emotional responses in um, the analysis phase where you're digging a bit deeper. Um, we don't have an answer, right? So the, mm. the diamond, the, the pearls framework, we have different frameworks that recognize that emotions are going to come in and, and how we need to address them. Um, this is where the researcher in me comes in and says, well, we'd need to do a study and say, well, could we do studies to try to find out when do we address the emotions and what context and different approaches to it? Um, and what would be the outcome, right? We have ways that we could measure their emotional reactions during the debriefing. We have ways that we could look at what the sequela is going to be on learned behavior. Um, yeah. We have theoretical models that can guide us, but the reality is, is that we actually need the research in this area to, to tell us those answers. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like I we should. That's uh, the answer. Yeah. I, yeah, that's the answer. Everybody always hates when a researcher says that. But I, I think we do need significantly more research to better understand the kind of the nuances of this in, in our environment. Yeah, absolutely right. I agree completely. Um, there's room for us to, to uh, start thinking about some research projects based on this. Um, yeah. So another question that comes in. What do we think about sort of the role of emotion, especially in debriefing during the kind of pandemic and post-pandemic world. Um, I would say post-pandemic is a ways off yet, but, but in the <laughs> midst of this, certainly, people are having some pretty traumatic experiences, um, uh, both uh, professionally and, and personally, of course. Um, how, do, you, do you expect that we'll need more time to attend to emotion during this period? Um, or what are your thoughts about that? I think we have to be prepared that it's gonna take more space. Um, you know, I've been seeing this, I sit on a lot of committees at our university, you know, about our undergraduate, about a postgraduate, and we have, we've had to put in a lot more time for the learners to come in and to ask questions about the things they're worried about or the uncertainties and everything like that. And we've had to attend to that a lot more. And I think, especially if we've developed simulation to be a safe learning environment where we have that learner contract, they put themselves in that vulnerable situation, we tend to have good relations with them this is where things are going to show up. This is where conversations are going to happen. They might, they might just be sharing their frustrations about the world there because that's their first point of contact, or they might be sharing, well, how am I going to address this? How am I going to address that situation? So I think there is going to be a lot more emotions, but there's also going to be about 
being in a clinical environment and having to perform clinically in an emotionally laden environment. So I think we do have to be prepared um, that this is going to be a bigger elephant in the room. And, and it might not even be an elephant in the room. It might be more explicit. So I do think we have to be comfortable um, and prepare ourselves that there's going to be a lot of that because part of what they need to learn is how do I function? How do I learn in this completely different world? Uh, and one that there are a lot of heightened emotions in it. That's right. And going back to your emotional management sort of idea, I think a lot of people um, are operating under this uh, sort of cultural norm, which is emotional suppression is the way to be successful in clinical practice. And actually, again, as we know, maladaptive, um, potentially yeah. quite problematic. So simulation gives us a way to um, renormalize in a sense, doesn't it? And, and sort of help people adopt a, a, a new norm, one that's more uh, appropriate and adaptive for the situations that we all find ourselves in. Yeah. And I think as simulation educators, I think we might, I, I think it behooves us to, to brush up on our knowledge of what are adaptive emotional regulation mm -hmm. strategies, both short-term and long-term, right. To, to, you know, to, to sit, name them, to normalize them, to legitimate them in this environment, to suggest to them, you know, here are reframing things you can do. Here are some breathing tactics that you can do to get everything calm. Here's how you can take a step out um, mm -hmm. and be careful about suppression. Be careful about doing these things. And then think about also long term, right? Make sure you have your social networks. Make sure you're, you're, you know, you're doing the mindfulness. We can do, you're not going to be able to teach somebody to do adaptive emotional regulation in, in one hour or in a two hour session, but we can keep reinforcing that and have okay. those resources, right? So we might want to come in and familiarize ourselves with this and have some skill, some, some information we can give them and say, here are some strategic ways that you can do that are going to actually help you uh, from an emotional perspective, be able to kind of, to manage this, this different world we're in. Professor Vicky LeBlanc, thank you so much for your time today uh, on behalf of CESAM and all of us in Europe and in the simulation community worldwide. We usually have people from North America who join us on these as well. So um, and, uh, and, and Australia and Asia and all around the world. So um, we're, we're very grateful that you've joined us today. Uh, thank you very much for your talk and thank you for your work. Thank you so much. And if there's anything that has come up that uh, we haven't had a chance to discuss and people want to talk about, um, I did put out my email. Do feel free to email me um, and we can continue that discussion. Or if the research questions that I've put out there are of interest to you, definitely interested in kind of following up on some of those questions. Fantastic. Vicki, thank you. Uh, and uh, with that, thank you all for joining us today and for your questions uh, through the live stream. And um, we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next Lou Oberndorf uh, lecture um, for CSAM, um, which will be coming up next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.